CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. And after all, what is a lie? Tis but the truth in masquerade, according to Lord Byron. Does it work both ways? Is the truth a lie in masquerade? Those great poets are not always easy to follow. Is it possible that there are neither absolute lies nor absolute truths, but varying degrees? of each. As we shall discover, perhaps, during the next hour. I want you to tell me everything you know about the murder. Well, what murder is that, Lieutenant? The murder that took place on your train this morning. Oh, now, wait a minute. That wasn't a murder. A fellow died of a heart attack. Yeah? Who told you it was a heart attack? Well, I mean, the way he just keeled over, I kind of thought... No. He was murdered. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Come Fill My Cup, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and William Griffiths. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Out of the shadows of the night... The world rolls into light. It is daybreak everywhere, sings the poet, yes. Daybreak and breakfast and off to the daily round of toil for one's bread. They gather at the railroad station in the town of Westville to catch the 749, which will bear them to the big city, more than 50 miles and 61 minutes away. And they purchase their big city newspapers. They stamp their feet against the cold. They exchange idle small talk till the big, shiny electric cars skitter to a stop along the platform and they scatter aboard and scramble for seats. Thus, another day has begun. Aboard! Aboard! My name is Frank Durham. I've been with the road 45 years. I can remember steam, diesels, now these. Forty-five years. Rain, shine, snow, hail. What do them letter carriers say? Well, we go through the same thing. It's funny. When people find out I'm conductor of the 749, they kind of look at me and say, Hey, isn't that the one? Yeah. It's the one where the guy was murdered. Now, as a rule, people don't get murdered on trains. Oh, I, I knew all about the Orient Express, but uh, a commuter train? So I guess you uh, want to know all about it. Okay. Tickets? I'll take us, please. Oh, say, what are you doing up here, Mr. Jorgensen? Morning, Frank. Yeah, I thought you'd be back in the club car with Jerry and them. Yeah, I decided to change my ways. No more cards. Out of fact. <laughs> you better believe it. Well, I hope for your sake it's true. No, Frank, it's all over. I don't need a sermon. I always felt that poker game was too rich for your blood. You've no idea how anemic it made me. Well, if you pardon my saying it, uh, you were in way over your head. Uh, Jerry Garland, at least a millionaire. So is Pete McHugh. That is for Bill. Mm. I'm well out of it. You listen to a man old enough to be your father. You see, you stay out of it. And that made me feel good. Don Jorgensen had been a patsy in this high-stakes poker game for more than a year. In the 61 minutes, Westville to New York, you could lose $100, $150 easy. And there were days Don did just that. Well, I went back to punch tickets in the club car. That's the last car in the 749's private car. You pay extra for it, but you can sit at a table, have coffee or breakfast, play cards. 
And you're away from the... Well, not the uh, riffraff, but, uh, how the fella put it, the uh, maddening throng or something. Tickets, gentlemen. Thank you. Frank, you seen Don? Hmm? I saw him on the platform getting on a train. He's holding up the game. Uh, look, you fellas sit here, play hand of gin or something, I'll route him out. Jerry got up from the table and started walking forward. I wondered what luck he would have with Don. When I went up ahead again, I saw him sitting next to Don. I moved slowly and stood behind him. I was curious. Everybody's luck turns, kid. Except mine. Now, uh, look, you enjoy the game. I can't afford it now, anymore. Now, that's an argument I can't budge. But I am reformed from now on. Okay, kid. I hope so. I got a book to read, a crossword puzzle. Look, I'm all for a guy kicking the habit, any habit. It's just, uh, it's just, what? Well, it's just, uh, I wish you didn't decide to kick it today. Why not today? Well, I feel lucky. <laughs> then I'm definitely picking the right time. I feel today is my day to take Peter McHugh. So go take him. Nobody wants to play three-handed. Well, you can pick up somebody else. No, there's not many guys with the courage to play in that game. Hmm. Not to mention the money. <laughs> Listen, Don, do me a favor. Quit tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. Play today. No. Come on, now. It's a favor to me. It sure wouldn't be a favor to me. Don, you can't lose. Would you like to know how much I lost this past year? What I'm trying to say. And to you, Jerry. It won't cost you a cent to play today, Don. Oh, yeah? Let's hear this. If you win, you win. Keep it. But if you lose, I'll pay you back. What? No matter how much. Just keep tabs, and I'll pay you back every cent later. Well, you must really want to play bad. Come on, come on, Don. I can hit Pete for a bundle. How can you lose? Okay. Just this once. I didn't know what to make of that whole conversation. Anyhow, Jerry and Don got up, walked to the club car. I finished up front, went back there myself for the morning coffee. Down toward the end of the car, I could see the poker game in full swing. I stood at the bar while Lou handed me my usual coffee and I ate, drank slowly. I turned to watch the poker players. I could hear the conversation, clinking of coins, and I could see the green of the bills. Pair of deuces is high. It's you, Jerry. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I see. Now... Here are deuces check. Deuces check. Dealer folds. So, ace high bets. That's you, Pete. Uh, this ace high bets ten bucks. Bill? I see you fold. Okay, that leaves it up to deuces, Jerry. Yeah, yeah, so it does. Well, the little deuces will see that ten buck bet and raise you twenty. <laughs> And that's about how it would go. Check and raise, which is about as cutthroat as poker can ever get. But at least they were honest about it. They didn't pretend it was a friendly game. It went on like that for a bit. And then... Who wants a cup of coffee? You, Pete? Uh, I had enough. Uh -huh. Bill? You still off coffee? Come on, fellas, I'm buying. How about you, Don? <laughs> when did you ever know me to turn down a cup of coffee? <laughs> yeah. I'll go up and get it now while I'm out of this hand. I'll be right back. You see, you got your card game going, Mr. Garland. Yep, yep, yep. We have to find a new recruit. Uh, no cup of coffee for me, Mr. Jorgensen. Come on, I'm losing money standing here. What's well, your thing, Mr. Garland? Just then... I thought I heard a kind of squealing sound. I left my coffee and walked back quickly to the rear cab. I opened the door to see if maybe we didn't have a jam break. But it was nothing. Anyhow, I stood there for a couple of seconds. I could see Lou at the bar up ahead pouring the two cups of coffee. He put them on the tray, and Jerry spilled a packet of sugar into each. Now, the reason I go into all these details is because... This is that famous, or what I should say, notorious day. When I started back for the bar, Jerry picked up the tray and started toward the table. Halfway, we met in the aisle. 
I was about to step aside to let him pass when we hit that curve just before we crossed the New York state line. Now, the train sways pretty bad, and I could see Jerry was about to lose his balance. Well, I wanted to help him, but as he fell back, he automatically thrust the tray forward, and I caught it and took it from his hands. He grabbed the back of his seat, and so did I. For a few seconds, we both nearly fell, but we both managed to keep our balance. Then Jerry took the tray back from me and went to his table, and I watched the game continue from the bar. Here's your coffee, Don. Oh, uh, thanks. It's five-card draw, Jerry. We dealt you in. Uh, Ante up five bucks. Ah, little Jack's a better, huh? <laughs> the famous name of the game. <laughs> well, let's take a sip of this coffee. And I'll examine my options. Hey, uh, let's get a move on, huh? We'll be in the terminal in less than 15 oh, minutes. come on, come on. There's enough time for entire fortunes to be made, Pete. Well, that's pretty good coffee this morning, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lou gets lucky once in a while. Speaking of luck, gents, she's uh, open for another $5. Bill? I see you fold. Call! I'm in, and now, cards. Hey, that is pretty good coffee. Hey, I want three. Three to Brother Pete. Yeah. Uh, give me two. Two to Jerry. And the dealer draws one. Uh, you know, more kids have lost out on a college education because their fathers drew to an inside street. <laughs> <laughs> Opener bet. That's you, Jerry. Uh, Jerry? Jerry, you gonna sit there and drink that coffee or what? Uh, all right, don't rush. Don't rush me. Don't rush our good friend. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Don, Don, you drew uh, three, huh? No, no, uh, Pete drew three. Uh, uh, you, uh, you, you bought. No, I, I drew one. Uh, oh, yeah, well, uh, one. Uh, Bill asked for... Uh, Bill uh, didn't ask for anything. Bill's out. Oh. Uh, Bill, Bill is out. <laughs> you know, it's hot in here. Somebody... I ought to ask Frank to turn down the heat. Hey, look, you're going to bet or not? How, what do you think I played it? Played this game for? I wish it wasn't so hot here. Hey, uh... Jerry, you okay? Yeah, it's... My bet, huh? Hey, uh... Pete, uh... Bill, I, I think there's something wrong with Jerry. I... I... I, I bet, uh... I, I bet, uh... Frank, uh, uh, come over here, oh, quick. Oh, my chest. Here I go. Oh, my chest. Oh, Frank... Frank, uh, you, you got a phone on this train? Uh, 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 call ahead for an ambulance. I, I got this. Uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry! Uh. I telephoned to have an ambulance meet us at the next station. There was also a doctor among the passengers in the third car, and he came back quickly. But it didn't matter. Nothing would matter anymore to Jerry Garvin. He was dead. They took him off the train... When we got to the terminal, I had a lot of writing to do, a lot of forms to fill out and reports to make. I was busy in the locker room when I heard a man ask for me. You Frank Durham? Yeah, that's right. I'm Lieutenant Parsons, New York City Police. Yeah? Uh, you're the conductor of train number 4231. It's the uh, 749 out of Westville, Connecticut. Sure. Hmm. I want you to tell me everything you know about the murder. What murder is that? The murder that took place on your train this morning. Well, wait a minute. That, that wasn't a murder. A fellow died. A man by the name of Gerald K. Garland. Yes, he died of a heart attack. Oh, yeah? Who told you it was a heart attack? Well, I mean, the way he keeled over, I kind of thought that... No, no. He was murdered. How could he have been murdered? He was poisoned. Well, how could he have been poisoned? That's just what I want to ask you. Okay, let's all ask ourselves How could he have been poisoned? And to get the red tape out of the way The facts are clear Lieutenant Parsons made that statement Because a medical examination showed definite traces of staramine A poison in the strychnine family So, we have our murder on the 749 But how? Look, this is only the end of Act One You'll have to be patient until I return with Act Two Everybody but cut the cards, said the beloved Mr. Dewey. Ah, yes. 
How many decks of cards have been cut and shuffled on the 749, the commuter express from Westville? Especially in the club car, where perhaps the most cuts road game has been going on for several years. Well, if the game keeps being cutthroat, someone may begin to take that word literally. Obviously, someone did. Except he didn't use a knife. He employed poison. Poison? Are you saying Jerry Garland was poisoned, Lieutenant? Well, that's what the medical examiner says, and it's good enough for me. But poison? How could he have been poisoned? As they say, it was ingested in the coffee he drank. Oh, no. Yes, happens to be the fact. Now, it took place in the club car. And uh, what was Jerry Garland doing at the time of his death? Uh, he was playing cards. He was part of this regular game. He was playing and drinking his coffee. Then he just keeled over. In the coffee. How did he get the coffee? He went up the bar for two coffees. Two coffees? Yeah, one for himself, the other for Don Jorgensen. Well, he uh, picked up the coffee. Uh, who served the coffee? Lou. Lou Vitry, our barman. Now, Lou poured out the coffee into the cups. Yeah, that's right. And Jerry put them on a tray and went back to the table. Now, would you know if there was uh, cream and sugar in the coffees? Yeah, yeah, now you mention it. I saw Jerry put in the cream and sugar himself while he was still at the bar. Into both coffees? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, uh, and then he went back to the table... And then what did he do? He gave one cup to Don Jorgensen, one cup to Captain for himself. Yeah? Well, it couldn't have been more than a couple, three minutes, and that was it. And he drank this coffee? Oh, yeah. Uh, the other cup of coffee, uh, the one he gave this... Um, uh, Don Jorgensen. Yeah, Don Jorgensen. He drank his coffee also? Yeah. You saw him do it? Oh, yes. Right. Hmm. I want you to stay with me while I question some of the people in that club car. When? As soon as I can round them up. I, uh, I have to take 1127 out. No, no. I don't think so. That was Detective Lieutenant Parsons. Grover Cleveland Parsons. Well, the first person he got hold of was Lou Vitry, the barman. All of a sudden, I got the shock of my life. But I'll, uh, I'll feed it to you gently, the way it was fed to me. Uh, how long have you been with the railroad? Five years, Lieutenant. What did you do before that? Why, uh, look, Lieutenant, is it important? I uh, just answered the question. I, I work for Mr. Garland. Jerry Garland? Yeah. As what? Well, I, I was his chauffeur. Well, why did you leave the job? <laughs> look, uh... Do I have to say this? Answer the question. Well, can the, uh, can the answer be confidential between me and the cops? Well, so far. Because if it's known, I can lose my job. Does uh, Frank have to hear me answer? Uh, no, he won't say anything. I guarantee it. Well, why could you lose your job? Because uh, I uh, I got a record. Hmm. For what? I uh, did three years for burglary. But I was innocent. Uh, tell him, though. Well... <laughs> One night, there was a burglary. Jewels that belonged to Jerry's wife, Theodora, were stolen. Well, they, they searched all the servants, naturally, and in my room, uh, I found a bracelet. Well, uh, what was it doing there? Well, it must have been planted there by the thieves to turn the heat on me. And, and it did. I, I, I was put away. Well, uh, how did you get the job on the railroad if you had this record? Jerry Garland got it for me. Why? Well, when I got out, I went to him to his office. Well, what are you doing here, Lou? You escaped from jail? Oh, I'm, I'm out, Mr. Garland. Oh. What do you want? Well, I didn't steal those jewels. Ah, look, Lou, it was all decided by a court of law. I ain't a crook, and you know it. Oh, well, maybe not, but you might have been tempted. Oh, never. I, I've been your show for 13 years. You trusted your kids to me when I was little. I lived in your house. Now, you know I ain't a crook. Mr. Garland, you got to help me. Well, Lou, if you need some money to get on your feet... No, I need more money. I need a job. I can't get a job. I got a record. You understand? Yeah, I know. I know it's tough, Lou. You don't know how tough it is. I'm, I'm turned down everywhere I go. Help me get a job. Give me a job. Now, can't very well take you back as my chauffeur. Why not? Well, how would it look? 
Can't you do anything for me? I'll take any job at all. He got me a job. This job. Uh, my name isn't Lou Vitry either. I had to change it. Vitry's my uh, mama's maiden name. Well, uh, how could the poison have gotten into Mr. Garland's cup? I don't know. Uh, huh? Okay, Lou. That's all for now. Just keep handy in case you need it. You can go. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Lieutenant. Well, he doesn't have a motive. He doesn't have a motive. But that's not true, Lieutenant. He does have a motive. And now I know what that motive is. He was the chauffeur. I never knew that. So now it all makes sense, that conversation I overheard in the bar in the club car a couple of weeks ago. The train was crowded. Jerry had gotten up from the card table and come over to pick up a couple of rounds of drinks. Standing at the bar was uh, Mr. Alexander Trowbridge. Yeah, the, the very big guy on Wall Street. Very strict, very dignified. Anyhow, Jerry spotted him and said... Hello there, Alex. Good evening, Mr. Garland. Well, it ain't every day I have the privilege of riding home on a train with uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> hey, let me buy you a drink. Thank you, I have one. Well, have another one on me. Uh, that won't be necessary, thank you. I never have more than one. Okay, Alex. Say, so, look, I may drop over to your office one day. I may have a little business to throw your way. <laughs> Jerry Garland had a hide like a rhinoceros, which is why you couldn't kill him with a bullet or a knife. You had to use poison. Anyhow, it was obvious to me that Mr. Trowbridge was very put out. And the fellow standing next to him spotted it, too. And I remember Trowbridge saying, I have every reason to suspect that man's a thief. There's no real proof, of course, but Swanson's company handles the man's insurance. He had a burglary some years ago. Wife's jewels were supposed to be stolen. Swanson could swear Garland pulled a swindle on the insurance company. Is that so? Mm, the jewels never turned up at any of the known receivers of stolen goods. Actually, Swanson must know more than he's telling, but he's stuck for proof. Uh, another uh, round here, please, Lou? Yes, sir. I know Swanson wouldn't make such a charge, uh, even off the record, unless he knew it was true. Meanwhile, some poor servant went to jail at... Oh, oh. oh I'm sorry, sir. Oh, that's all right, Lou. I, uh, it uh, spilled all over you. Well, it's just water. No harm done. Was that why Lou dropped the glass? Was that why he turned so pale? I didn't think anything about it at the time. But now... Now it makes sense. The lieutenant had just said that Lou Vitry did not have a motive, but he did have. Uh, yeah, Frank. I know about it. About Lou having a motive? Yep. He told me himself. He figured if this kind of thing was being talked about, how Jerry Garland himself could have staged a robbery... It was sure to get the cops, and then he'd really be in a jam. Well, uh, he's in a jam anyhow, isn't he? Well, well, not exactly. You see, if he poisoned the coffee and then gave two cups to Jerry to take back to the table, how could he be sure which cup Jerry would drink? Yeah, yeah. Frank, you see these fellas every day. Who had a motive for killing Jerry? Well... Nobody really liked him. Well, uh, who were his friends? In the club car? Hmm? Well, he had no friends that I knew of. Nobody really liked him. Well, uh, who might have liked him the least? Uh, you get into a discussion of human nature, Lieutenant. Uh, Bill Russell, one of the regulars in the game, never opened his mouth except a bet. Now, how do I know what that man thought? Uh, Don Jorgens. Well, he, uh... He didn't like Jerry. Over the year, he must have lost at least 15000 in that game. Jerry was practically the only big winner. Well, 15000 could be a motive for revenge. No, but take Pete McHugh. He fancies himself the best poker player in the world. Yet Jerry was always taking his money. 
A lot of money? No. no. The big loss was pride. Is that a motive? No, 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 no not really. Uh, this uh, Don Jorgensen. Tell me more about him. <laughs> Funny thing. This morning he decided to quit the game. But he went back for a kind of a farewell. Ah, uh, let's see what we can do with Don Jorgensen. You lost heavily. Well, I wouldn't say so, Lieutenant. Now, it is common knowledge aboard the 749 that you were an unusually big loser. Now, is that true? Well, actually, in a friendly game, you don't notice. Now, look, so... we've got a murder case. And you'd better tell me the truth. Now, we know you work for Simmons and Boswell at Wall Street. And we know what your salary is. We know just about how much you've been losing. Now, hold on, Lieutenant. I... Uh, shall we check your bank to see what loans you negotiated and your insurance company to see if any policies were cashed in? Of course, if you borrowed from the loan sharks, you will really need our help. Okay. It's true. You want to know what I lost? $21,364.87. You see? I know it to the penny. How could it happen? Well, if you take the train an average of 200 days a year, you lose an average of $100 a day. Well, not every day. Sometimes you win. <laughs> I even won $300 one morning, but that's just the cheese in the trap. Don't ask me why I kept doing it. It's, it's a bad dream. It cost me my wife. She's going to divorce me. You suspect that Jerry was cheating. Yes. Did you kill him? No. I think you did. Lieutenant, I swear to you, I'm innocent. And I think I know how you worked it. The only way you could have worked it. That's pretty good. If Don Jorgensen wanted to have Jerry Garland drink a cup of poisoned coffee, how could Don have worked it? Since, as we saw, Jerry got the two cups of coffee. Jerry handed out the coffee. How could Don be sure he wasn't getting the wrong one? Well, Lieutenant Parsons has made his deduction on facts and inferences that were available to all of you. Why don't we compare notes in Act 3? Sam Johnson, whom we quote quite often because he knew practically everything worth knowing, declared that a man could do anything if he did it in a genteel way, even cheat at cards. Well, Sam Johnson never rode in a commuter train. Jerry Garland cheated, and in the opinion of the police, that's why someone, namely Don Jorgensen, murdered him. But I didn't do it. You don't have to say anything. Am I... Am I being arrested, Lieutenant? Mr. Jorgensen, because of Jerry Garland, you lost your wife. All the money you had. No. I lost everything because of my own weakness. And so you decided to kill him. You're wrong. You worked out this scheme to poison him. What good would it do for me to kill him? Would it burn out the disease I have inside of me? This, this mania to gamble? I swore I would quit, but I can't. You figured you would poison his coffee. How? Frank, you saw. The whole club car saw. Jerry went to the bar. He got the coffee. If there was poison in one cup, I could have gotten it. No. You had a way to guard against that. How? How could I guard against that? With the help of Lou Vitry. Lou Vitry? Don Jorgensen. Lou Vitry. Two men with powerful motives to kill Jerry Garland. But I tell you, I... First, wait to hear what I tell you. You knew Jerry liked to treat everybody to coffee so he could brag about it. You knew he would go to the bar to get it. And you also knew the other two at the table, Pete and Bill, never drank coffee. So you knew it would only be two cups. I knew nothing of the sort. Jerry would go up to get the coffee. Lou would pour him the poison cup. Yeah, but how could Lou make sure I wouldn't drink it? Because Lou would know which cup was which. And if Jerry set the poison one down next to you, he would give you the high sign. And you would make an excuse or forget to drink it. It... It isn't true. Well, Lieutenant, uh, could I talk to you in private for a second? It uh, couldn't have worked that way. No? No. Well, makes sense. Oh, I got two guys with a motive. 
Even if you could prove that Don knew about Lou's motive, uh, you don't have a case. Why not? Because I saw Lou pour that coffee. It was from the same glass pot that he poured about ten other cups, including mine. That was the only coffee. You, uh, drank that same coffee? So did Don and eight other people in the car. Well, then it was in the cream. Oh, we all use the same cream pitcher. Oh, the sugar. Uh, now, the sugar was in separate packets. Yes, it was. They were piled in a dish. And I saw Jerry reach in, pick out two, pour one in each cup. Everybody used those packets from that dish. There was no way either Lou or Don could control any single packet if it contained the poison. Are you sure of that? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, how did that poison get into that coffee? Now, I've got two great motives, Lou and Don. But there's no way I can find for any of them to get the poison in his cup. Time went on. Days passed, and I guess life went on also. I don't know what happens to a murder case when it doesn't get solved and the papers stop writing about it. I suppose it just sort of gets into a file cabinet somewhere. Well, 749 left Westville as usual on or about on time. The club car found other things to talk about. The card game continued with Don back in, but the new member was Mr. Trowbridge. And because he was so fabulously rich, they played for pennies. But I kept thinking and thinking about the murder. Well, one night I was taking my evening run home and I stopped in the club car. Tickets, please. Tickets. Hello, Frank. Oh, evening, Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, Frank, I never did get a chance to thank you properly for what you did for me. What did I do for you? Well, the day Jerry was, you know, uh, that cop, he was all set to lower the boom, and then you just took him aside. What'd you tell him? Well, I just said, a fine, clean-cut chap like you, how could you possibly be a killer? Mm. I bet you did. You'd be better off if you never bet again in your life. See you. Tickets, please. Tickets. Thank you. Oh, good evening, Mr. Trombridge. Evening, Frank. No poker tonight? Well, if I may rephrase the title of a grand old song, those wedding bells are breaking up that old game of mine. Oh, who's getting married? Yeah, at the bar there. Don. But didn't he just get divorced? Oh, well, certainly. He had to shed the old one before he could acquire a new one. You're not allowed to have two at a time in our culture. <laughs> well, one was all I could ever handle. Uh, capacities differ, Frank. Oh, uh, there she is now. She's just come up to the bar. Do you wonder that he finds her company more exciting than our poker game? No, but don't wonder at all. There is a beautiful young lady. You mean uh, you don't know who she is, Frank? Oh, can't say that I do. She's Dora. Hmm? Theodora Garland, Jerry's widow. She's Jerry's widow? Huh. You mean you never met her? No. Well, for that matter, Mr. Trowbridge, I never met your wife either. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's true. She's Dora Garland. Huh. How could you figure to be this young and this pretty? Mm. And how could you ever figure what she saw in Jerry? the bar. Suddenly, I realized that I had seen her before. Somewhere before. But where? Where? And then I remembered where. At the bar in the terminal. I owed Tom Franklin a run, and I was waiting to take the 1008 out. I was having a beer. There was a man, and there was a woman sitting in the booth ahead of me. The man had his back to me. I couldn't see his face, but I knew it was Don Jorgensen. The woman was facing me. She was that woman. Now I know who she was. Dora Garland. And she and Don Jorgensen were having, as they say, an affair. And from what I knew of Jerry, 
He was the type who would kill both of them if he found out. So to the long list of motives for murder, add one more. But a good, strong one. Ah, now, Frank, don't give me any more suspects, huh? I don't want no more motives. I got all of those I can handle. I'll tell you what I need. I need what I can't get. The way any one of them or two of them could have put that poison into the coffee. Eh, why don't you forget it? Well, it happened on my train. I, I feel responsible. Yeah, well, maybe you did it, huh? Me? Yeah, well, did I put together everybody's story, Frank. I think you left something out. What? You could have poisoned that coffee. Why? How? Why, I can dig around for. How? Okay. Jerry was starting back to the table with the coffee tray. Okay. Now, you're headed the other way, up the aisle. The train gives a lurch. Jerry almost falls. You grab the tray from him. For just a second. Long enough, maybe, to put that poison in the cup. Yeah? Well, here's what's wrong with that theory. First, how could I have, in those few seconds gotten the tops off the cups and put in the poison. Tops? Well, Lou always puts those plastic tops on the cups so you won't spill any. Yeah. Second, even if I was a magician and could do it, how could I be sure which cup Jerry himself would drink? Well, that's a good theory. Well, maybe the coffee wasn't poisoned in the club car. It had to be. That poison works within minutes. No. No. I am afraid we're stuck. It sure looked that way. A couple days passed, and I was on the 749 again, and somehow it didn't seem the same without Jerry. A likable guy he wasn't, but he sure livened things up. And there was another side to him. I remembered it was a couple days before he died. He was the first one on the train. He was sitting at the table waiting for the others. And there was a look on his face that I'd never seen before. I, uh, I guess it was a lost look. Morning, Mr. Garland. Mm. Oh, morning, Frank. Oh, something uh, wrong this morning, Mr. Garland? Wrong? Why do you say that? Well, I don't know. I guess you just look kind of, uh, you know, blue. Do I? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd like to murder a couple of people, but that couldn't be the reason. Well, we'll get the old game started. That puts a bloom in the cheeks. Now I remembered. That was the morning after I had seen his wife, Dora, in the bar at the terminal. So he had found out. And he was actually thinking of murder. I just needed one more little fact. Morning, Mr. Jorgensen. See you up in the club car in the strip. No, Mr. Trowbridge is on vacation and Pete is sick today, so I thought I'd sit up here and catch up on some paperwork. <laughs> Too noisy back there. Uh, Don, when did Mr. Garland find out you were having an affair with his wife? Say, what are you... Just answer the question. Well, not just a... Well, about a week before he died. How did you know that he knew? Did he tell you? No. Did he tell Dora? No. And how did you know? Frank, did you ever have an affair with another man's wife? Nope. You're not missing anything. But when the husband finds out, you can tell. You can tell by certain little things in his manner. Is that why you and Dora decided to kill him? No. Oh, no. No, we were scared, yes, but... For our own lives. Now, you knew Jerry. He was a... He was a violent man. So why did you fool around with his wife? You know why? To get back at him. He destroyed me. He stripped me of all my money. My wife walked out on me with the kids. I had to get back at him. And this was the only way I could. It was the one place I could prove I was a better man than he was. <laughs> And then I saw it. I saw the whole thing. Why did we all wonder who wanted to kill Jerry? Why didn't we ask who it was that Jerry himself wanted to kill? Why did we believe that the poison was intended for Jerry? Why couldn't it be meant for Don Jorgensen? 
Now what, Frank? Lieutenant, you said I could have been responsible for Jerry's death. You were right. I was. Are you crazy? Jerry decides to kill Don. Okay. He goes for the coffee. Lou pours. Jerry then opens the sugar package. Jerry is in a position to use the packet that he had with him that contains the poison. Ah, uh-huh. I notice you're listening now. Hey, go on. Now, Jerry comes back to the table with the tray. He knows which cup he has poisoned. But the train gives a lurch. He almost falls. He's about to drop the tray. I'm there. I grab it from him. He saves himself from falling, and his eye is off me for a second or two. I have to stop myself from falling. I switch the tray from my right hand to my left. Unconsciously, I turn it around. He can't see that. It all happens so quickly. I give him the tray as if nothing happened. He gets to drink the poison coffee. And how do we prove it? I guess we don't. But I believe it. Do you? The lieutenant didn't commit himself. Do you believe it? It makes sense. Satisfies all the conditions. But we are dealing with the most unpredictable materials in nature. Namely, human beings. Maybe Pete McHugh, the jealous card player, did it somehow. Maybe it was Lou. And or Don and or Dora. Could we swear on our souls it wasn't the conductor? I'll be back with more from the realm of infinite possibility. Our story was about cards. What did a great master of cards say on the subject? The bizarre world of cards. A world of power politics, where punishment and rewards were meted out immediately. A deck of cards is built like the purest of hierarchies, with every card a master to those below it, a lackey to those above it. And there were the masses, the long suits, which always asserted themselves in the end and triumphed over the aces and the kings. Thus spoke the great player, Eli Culbertson. And he was in the know. Our cast included William Griffiths, Larry Haynes, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. How in the world did he accomplish it? The door, the window, and chimney were impassable. The flooring and walls were solid. Well, then Julia Stoner was undoubtedly alone when she met her death. It would appear so, but then how do you account for these nocturnal whistles and a very peculiar words of the dying woman? Well, well I, I can't account for any of it, Holmes, unless they were hallucinations. Not likely that the two women would be afflicted with the same hallucination about whistles in the night. And only one of them referred to the speckled band. Yeah. Well, you, you've evidently formed some conclusions... Otherwise, we wouldn't this very moment be on our way to Stoke Moran. Mm, no conclusions, my dear doctor. Only surmises, which have to be checked on the spot before I can even begin to make deductions. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>